Welcome. It's March 25th, 2020, and we're in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, today, we're honored to have Dr. Craig Faid. Did I pronounce that right, doctor? Uh, well, we say Fied, but that's why Fied. You that's just go by Craig. That'll, that'll do it for us. Now, Dr. Craig, uh, I'm, I'm classically known for putting foot in mouth, as we know, so I'm sure this won't be the first or last time that I do that. We are also welcome to have Dr. Peter Stein uh, and Jill Friedman um, and myself. And what we would like to do with you today is basically ask one very simple question. And that is, what is going on and how can our patients survive this crisis that's a little bit beyond the imagination of even Hollywood at this point? And we have a lot of patients who are autoimmune compromised. We have a lot of patients that are sleep deprived already, uh, who have respiratory issues, that have mental health issues, that are taking drugs that might be counterintuitive to what we should be doing in a, in a situation like that. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. Um, we want to talk to the best. Uh, we are by no means experts, but we feel like if we could start to gather and learn from each other and be able to disseminate what makes the most sense to give people practical help uh, and knowledge and what they should do next and then the next step, I think we will uh, have some sort of impact on this crisis uh, as as big and as, as large of a global pandemic issue as this is. Um, so with that being said, Jill, do you have something you want to sort of throw out here with, with your history as the founder of ACOR and of bringing hundreds of cancer communities online and co-founder of Smart Patients uh, as far as a patient-led and patient-hosted sort of um, discussion with sleepapnea.org? Uh, yes, but, but before I do this, I want to follow up on what you are saying. Anything we can do to help people deal with the massive uncertainty that they are facing every day is going to be is going to have a real impact. So, whatever we can do in the next thirty minutes to help with the, those all those uncertainties will be welcome. Uh, Let me introduce. Want, go ahead. Yes. No. No. Go ahead. I was going to introduce, um, I'd like to ask Dr. Dr. Craig and Dr. Peter to sort of give a background on, on their expertise and why we brought them to this call, because uh, I think I'll butcher more of their background and translating it into layman's terms than, than uh, the other way around. So if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Craig, we'll let you go first. Okay, thank you so much, Adam. Well, let's see, I am a physician board certified initially in emergency medicine and then worked for many years in vascular medicine, uh, also in preventative medicine and particularly in uh, clinical informatics. And for a number of years, I've been chief scientist with Whispersom Corporation, which is developing less invasive ways of managing sleep apnea, ways that might be effective for people who cannot tolerate CPAP or for whom CPAP is, is not a not the best option or not a good option. And uh, I also spent many years as head of the Institutes for Innovation in Washington, D.C. We had uh, quite, a, quite a large group of people working on innovation in every area of medicine, from nursing to critical care to outpatient, to prepatient, pre-hospital and emergency. Part of our that uh, system, we had a large project, multi-year project, federally funded to develop new hospital designs that would be all risks ready, that would scale up tenfold or 20-fold in the event of a disaster, precisely like the disaster we're facing now. Uh, we worked extensively in bioterrorism, and bioterrorism is something that occurs very rarely. We hope never. And as a result, and we've had a, only a few incidents of bioterrorism in the world yeah. since we started working in this more than 20 years ago, but the model that occurs every year that behaves just like bioterrorism is emerging disease. Because every year we have these diseases emerging, mostly in the area of Wuhan and, and a few other hot spots. And then most years they piddle out on their own, they get shut down, they're well contained, you get a small cluster of cases. Every so often we end up with effective human-to-human -human transmission and it takes more public health effort to control it 
we've seen those, but most people are aware of those larger events. And then, of course, our greatest fear is that one of these will escape and be the, the mixture of transmissivity and, uh, and lethality that creates the kind of perfect storm we're seeing now. Uh, of course, the one we're seeing now isn't as bad as it could get, but it is absolutely bad enough. And so uh, I'm happy to be able to help in any way I can and bring any of the perspective that I have to this conversation. Well, thank you so much, because I'm sure everybody on this call already just learned more in, in five minutes than we probably learned in the last three weeks. Um, Peter, Jills, please jump in and ask the questions you guys want to ask um, as it relates to our patients' concerns directly in regards to sleep apnea, CPAP machines, and this virus, and what we should be doing at home and what we should be doing, whether we have to go to a temporary MASH type unit or hospital, is, are these machines aerosoling the virus? Um, is it exacerbating the lungs? Is it helping prevent potential respiration issues or failures? Um, those are the kind of concerns we're hearing online. I think it would be good to start with the basics. Everybody is hearing about ventilators that we are like going to have a big uh, problem with not enough ventilators. And I'm not sure that most people know what a ventilator is and how the ventilators connect in any way, how they are related with CPAP machines. So talking about what is a ventilator and explaining differences between positive air pressure and negative air pressure would be, I think, useful. Well, I'd be happy to speak about that if you'd like, if somebody else, unless somebody else wishes to do so. Hey, I should give a, a, let me just pause and give a big background on myself. I'm a scientist engineer, you know, and I have, but, um, and of the, of the MIT ilk, and I have a uh, brother, a sister, a daughter, and a son, they're all MDs, and I'm constantly reminded that I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> 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 however, however, in, in, in this potential, in, th in this particular instance, you know, I'm, all, I'm a data weaning and I'm watching and I'm looking at everything and I'm looking how things go. And I'm also a sleep apnea patient who ran into trouble and had a CPAP machine. And yes, I have a lot of questions about what happens if I get it and also what it means to all of my uh, uh, comrades in, in arms here on this, on this issue. And so, you know, some of my questions are, yes, what are the basic differences between a ventilator and a CPAP machine? And I believe I can answer that and I because I believe a ventilator also has a pull to it where a CPAP machine is just positive pressure. Um, but uh, also, um, you know, uh, I hear rumors that it's not good for you. I hear rumors coming out of China that there's a lot of autopsies and clearly what's going on is there's a, there's a serious lung obstructions happening here where, where mucus is being calcified. And so, yeah, what does this all mean for us that, that have, uh, that have, uh, we're, we're, we're the patients with, uh, with, uh, with, with problems that are at risk. So yeah, definitely want to hear from you. <laughs> well, Adam, you're, you know, the, the first question there was about, um, <laughs> ventilation. What is ventilation yes. versus, you know, airway support? So let me, let me just start with this. When we breathe in, normally our lungs have negative pressure. We, our diaphragms descend, and that creates a, a vacuum, a slight vacuum, and air is pulled in. That's the physiologic way that breathing occurs, negative intrathoracic pressure. If we take a patient who has very poor musculature, can't make their respiratory muscles work, or nerve damage, the most physiologic way to treat them would be in the iron lungs that were heavily used during the era of polio. I believe there's one patient in the world today still living in an iron lung. Maybe there are more. There's one I'm, of whom I'm aware. The, um, the advent of intubation tubes that go down the throat, through, <clears throat> through the vocal cords, into the trachea, with a little balloon that blows up right at this level. Um, that allowed us to control breathing very quickly and easily without putting people in this massive room-sized iron lung. Uh, we don't really have iron lungs anymore. Right. So 
when we do that, we blow air in to inflate your lungs. And then we stop blowing air in and your lungs natural elasticity blows the air back out. Got it. And that is a perfectly normal and healthy way to breathe except for one thing. It's positive pressure during blowing the air in as opposed to negative pressure during blowing the air in. That has a lot of effects on the heart, the refilling of the heart, the blood flowing back into the thorax from your periphery, from your arms and legs, Mm -hmm. getting into the heart. Sometimes that's a positive kind of an effect. It can help to unload the heart in a patient with congestive heart failure. If you have less blood flowing in, your heart is less overstretched. Um, your blood, your heart may be able to push blood out into the into your chest more easily because it's not already full of blood, and so it, that kind of thing. Positive pressure ventilation can be life saving for those people where negative pressure ventilation really didn't help them that much. Right. But for most people, there is a slight risk that over time we overinflate the lungs, we may injure the lungs um, in this way, particularly if one part of the lung is collapsed and the other part is open. The air may not go to the collapsed part. It may go preferentially to the open part. Just like when you blow into a balloon, you know those those long, thin balloons that they make at fairs that no normal human being can blow up? You try to blow into there, blow as hard as you can. You cannot get it to start stretching. But once you get it popped open, now you can blow pretty easily because the pre-stretched part expands much more readily, much less tensile strength sort of holding it together. And uh, that can happen in the lungs. So the closed part doesn't get the air. The open part gets overinflated, and you can end up with alveolar injury, lung injury. That is one of the mechanisms by which ventilators, respirators that push air into your lungs um, can cause harm in patients with this COVID-19 because they do have many areas of the lung that are collapsed. And, And not just collapsed like an ordinary pneumonia, where maybe it's collapsed and you might like to pop it open and splint it open, then it would be fine. Maybe it was collapsed because it had a little fluid in it or white blood cells in there. Not like that. In this case, we're talking about interstitial, meaning between the cells, thickening. The entire walls of that thing are becoming extremely thick. And it's not, they're just, they inherently don't have the flexibility at that point that they should have. They may be, now it's possible, they may be gummed down by thick, inspissated mucus that's dried up. I have not seen those autopsy reports. I've heard many reports of that kind. At this moment, in my community, they are regarded as rumors. Right. Um, the only autopsies that I've seen have not shown inspissated mucus. And uh, there are things, special things we can do to treat that mucus, but if it's not there, it won't help us to treat them. So I hope I've answered at least one question. Perhaps I'll stop at this point and, and uh, let us refocus. I think we could ask uh, a thousand follow-ups. Uh, I'd go to Peter first as far as the first one that you had on your mind. I know, I know the one that, that, that I had is, you know, and I've already considered is, you know, am I, is, is this the time where, you know, do I go get a, a tracheotomy? Is that the best preventative mechanism because of potentially what happens in the, in, in the world and loss of power? Um, if I get an upper respiratory issue, upper airway issue, um, is that a crazy uh, maneuver? Is that a, uh, you don't do that unless it's, it's, it's last resort? You know, that's, that's the first thing that came into my mind. <laughs> I see you shaking your head. I'm not sure I do extreme things, but um, so the simple question is, is you get sick, you get it, you're not too bad, you're told to stay at home, do you stay on your CPAP machine? Or do you wrestle with a way of not being on the CPAP machine? Do you just... Uh, Drink tons of caffeine and stay up all the time. Do something that makes sure you're not on that, that don't use it. <laughs> you know, you can't. It's like the electricity went on you. <laughs> I, I would, I've heard that kind of uh, thing being batted around. I would disagree with that. Right. Here's, because here's what's happening. Let's suppose you're a person who does not normally use or need CPAP. You have normal lungs and you may be. Uh, thinking you're fine and you're going to get away with this. Maybe you're out partying on the beach in Florida, you know, a a week ago or two weeks ago. And now all of a sudden you're feeling worse than you've ever felt in your life. Mm -hmm. And you start having trouble breathing. And, you know, on on maybe the second or third day, you get a lot worse. You go to the hospital and you're judged to be sick enough to need to be admitted. 
So let's first ask, on what basis do we make that decision? Well, generally, it's you, if you cannot oxygenate adequately at home. So that means if we put a finger pulse oximeter on you and you are desaturating at rest, then you need supplemental oxygen at least. And we know that once you need supplemental oxygen, many people progress to needing more and more and more and ultimately cannot oxygenate with either with nasal cannulas or even with a mask of, of oxygen. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we have to choose how do we improve oxygen getting into the blood. And there's something called the P to F ratio. It's how much inspired oxygen we're giving you versus how much is in your blood. When that ratio gets to be higher, um, only intubation will work. But there's this gray zone in between where non-invasive ventilation has been the go-to therapy in the emergency department, in the ICU for many, many years for patients with many problems, including pneumonia. And so non-invasive ventilation in the hospital means a mask like a CPAP mask, but typically we are working more with a full face mask. Now this is a CPAP mask, but it's a total face mask. This one is, uh, I think this is the life fit or the fit yeah. life. Yeah. Um, this is the closest thing that is available to consumers that matches what we do in the hospital, which is to put something over like this that um, people who aren't used to a mask can, can tolerate because they don't have the acclimatization time. They're already sick. They're fighting to breathe. Um, better than this is perhaps even the whole hood ones. You've probably seen these on television. They're common in China and in Italy in which this large plastic bulb is put over your entire head and inflated. Those Some places they've fabricated those out of old water bottles. Um, I've seen a a, um, an ICU intensivist who uh, taught us how to fabricate them out of a plastic bag, a Ziploc bag. They put a, an oxygen tubing into one corner of the bag and turn up the oxygen flow and put a valve, an exit valve on the other corner of the valve of the bag. And then they put it over the head and tape it down. And you turn the oxygen flow up high enough, the oxygen flows in, um, you can inhale it, if they blow it in enough that it blows up the bag and creates a little bit of pressure. They control the pressure by putting what's called a peep valve on the end of the outflow portion. Yes. The peep valve, you just tighten it down until the back pressure is what you want it to be. If you don't have a peep valve, you take the end of a tubing and you put it in a, in a vessel of water, a bottle of water, and you tape it so that it's down as many centimeters of water as you want the back pressure to be. So five centimeters of water, you've got five centimeters of peep. Um, bubble, call that bubble pap. When, um, when these things are done, what's happening is that we're inflating any unused alveoli, any that were clo you know, closed down, and briefly we expect to get better oxygenation, better ventilation. And people will look better, they'll feel better, their oxygen levels will come up. That's exactly the same thing as putting on your CPAP mask, with the exception of the fact that we're supplying supplemental oxygen. So I don't think, given that our therapy, our initial therapy is non-invasive ventilation, which, which starts with CPAP, um, I don't think there's any reason not to use your CPAP at home. The thing that we do differently with non-invasive ventilation that goes beyond CPAP is if that alone is not good enough, then we move the people to BiPAP. Effectively, we're doing the exact same thing. And Adam, you are muted. So although you're moving your mouth, I'm not actually hearing you say yes. <laughs> but, yes. But uh, BiPAP, you know, a lot of people have BiPAP machines at home. That's basically what we would put you on in the hospital. And when we talk about having ventilator shortages for many, many people, if you're going into the hospital and you've got a BiPAP machine, bring it with you because that may be, we may be tweaking the settings, but that may be exactly what we would be wishing we had to put you on or to put people on. You may spare somebody else. Uh, the need for that. Machine. It's like the American Express commercial. Don't leave home without it. Don't you got it. it. You got and, it. Bring it with you. And of course, with BiPAP, we're giving a little extra pressure during inhalation, right. less pressure during exhalation. Now, the problem with CPAP is, of course, it raises the work of breathing. You actually have to work a little bit more to get the air out. BiPAP takes that away by takes away a lot of the work of your inhalation. So net net, you come out positive. Right. Um, with that said. Most people who are put on non-invasive ventilation, and if they don't get better right away, they tend to progress to need to be intubated anyway. 
to need to be intubated because we need higher pressures. We need more control. We need to be able to uh, control the absolute volume that gets given as well as the pressures that are given. Some BiPAP machines have ventilatory assist and you can have all those controls on them. Most, most really don't. The amount of volume that you get depends on uh, the pressures or on how long you try to inhale. Let me ask you a simple question. I've I always wondered, and and I know we've taken apart machines before, but you know it, it's always nice to hear this from experts. Are the guts and the parts primarily the same for CPAPs, BiPAPs, and ASVs, auto server ventilators? It's just a matter of the algorithms in there that that to control how the the files flow. Is that a fair assessment to say? Okay. okay. Yeah, um, the space bar stopped working for me. <laughs> I don't know why, but, um, the, uh, the first thing that's different is between the high end, very complex CPAP machines and a common ventilator. The first thing that's different is primarily just the industrial nature of a commercial machine intended to be used in a hospital. Right. Um, modern CPAP machines can have a long MTB at mean time between failures. They can really run a long time without breaking down. And so there's no, no real practical difference between a, you know, a CPAP machine and a an hospital ventilator on that, on that uh, sort of axis anymore. There used to be. But I think we're talking about the ability to be sterilized, to be moved between patients, to treat some of the edge cases, settings that would allow you to treat edge cases, uh, patients who require ventilatory speeds that you'd never do with a CPAP machine. Uh, people who might have 100 breaths per minute, so high-speed oscillatory ventilation, jet ventilation, uh, those kinds of things. Other than that, I think it's really just a matter of the intended purpose, the functions, the valves are the same. So that would lead me to my next question, and, and there's a lot of you know, rumors and stuff on the internet and, and so-called hacks uh, of people, you know, Taking old CPAPs, we have, a, you know, our CPAP assistance program, unfortunately, we don't even have any more machines, but we do have our, uh, an inventory of factory sealed CPAP masks that are probably will wind up going to one of these states uh, to supplement uh, the inventory shortages that are going on right now. So we've been in discussions with a couple of the states. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 it was funny. I was going through my garage a couple of weeks ago, and I found one of my old Respironics bricks and I was literally about to throw it away. And, and I was like, you know what? I'll just leave this here. Somebody might need this. And I, and I know that whether it's my neighbor or somebody else, this thing gonna, is going to save somebody's life. And, you know, it's just I, I know the surpluses are sitting out there. And, you know, I know there's, there's, there's discussions over purchasing them. But we know the inventories are in the warehouses. We don't know what the quantities are. Uh, but it's time that we go and get those. And then it's time as a country we come together and start making enough so that we have enough beds and we have enough respirators and ventilators so that we can learn about this virus spread out the window and basically not kill our healthcare system. Cause right now we're going to kill the system and the frontline workers. Uh, Cause they're going to be sleep deprived. They're going to be autoimmune compromised from this virus. And we already know that what scares me and what Peter and I keep discussing is the, the growth rate for the closed cases that we're seeing with some of the data coming out from the, the coalesced stuff all over the world. And if, if that growth rate really is, is, is accurate, you know, that's, that's, it, that's where the, it's not Wuhan, it's multiple Wuhan, it's New York, it's Florida, it's Louisiana, it's Texas, it's California. It, 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 this doesn't discriminate. So, you know, I'm not trying to be a whistleblower, but, you know, I want to know what we can do as, as a sleep field, as a sleep patient community, uh, to get the word out there, the right information out there, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. One, one question that you had raised in writing that I would like to make sure we do address here. Yeah, absolutely. Is the question of increased risk to those around you when you are using your CPAP. Um, and so to address that, I would point out that most ventilators that are used in a hospital today are so, supported so-called dual circuit or uh, closed circuit ventilators. That is, the patient is on one end, and then there are two tubes that go back to a ventilator. Right. So the inhaled air goes in one, and the exhaled air goes out the other and gets captured, filtered, 
and it usually goes through a CO2 absorber uh, if it's used in the operating room or that sort of thing. Whereas most CPAP is single limb, the air comes in to the patient, and then from there, there has to be a leak. When you exhale, you exhale into the mask. In the older style, the air goes down, the exhaled air goes down the tubing, and then the forward flow pushes it back out through a leak that's put in somewhere into the tubing. Right. With more modern masks, the leak is built into the mask very often. Right. In this particular model, the leak is built into a valve. So the valve here that is going into the mask has the leak built into it. The mask is airtight. This leak, this little leak that's right here, yeah. everything you breathe out goes out that leak, plus all the extra air that's blowing in to wash the carbon dioxide out of your mask because you don't want to rebreathe your own carbon dioxide. Of so this becomes a forceful jet of air that is absolutely packed with infective particles. Where we talk about a three foot or a six foot radius, a patient wearing one of these probably has a 30 foot jet. <sighs> of course, a sneeze or a cough can, tr can cause air to travel that far. You can see it easily with an infrared camera. Right. But this is what's freaking out the nurses when patients come in and they're sick, but they're not yet requiring ventilation and it's night and they want to put their CPAP on and the nurses don't want that because they feel now this stuff's blowing right at my face. It's going to get in the little cracks between my mask and, or you may be at home and being told to quarantine. Maybe you're the only one who's been told to quarantine. What do you do about your family? Uh, if you're going to, are you going to wear this thing or not? So these are questions we don't have good answers to. I do think that if you put some sort of fabric collector around this, you know, uh, two layers of pillowcase or something, the particles will be trapped in, in there. The air will come out and will be no worse than your normal exhalations. Would you be worried about still trapping the CO2 in that extra bag or that extra layer? No, these vents are one way. They only yeah. allow, unless you overpower it, you cannot breathe in through this. You can, there's a built-in, you know, if, if let's say it got blocked down here, um, then you breathe in hard enough, you could pull air in through there. But generally speaking, that's not going to happen. Great. Peter, Jills, please. I'm, I'm a little bit trying to absorb it also. As when, you know, when, I, when I talk to Dr. Craig, it, uh, he has a way of, uh, he's been teaching a long time and he has a, a way of, uh, what, do, what do they say? Uh, brainwashing <laughs> a little, a, a little uh, voice technique so i'm so, a little bit, a little bit Shiro, i was reading numbers coming from the fda on march 22 yep. about the number of existing ventilators in hospitals and what may be the need if the crisis really evolves the way they think so there is 162,000 existing ventilators across hospitals in the u.s there might be an additional 15,000 available from the federal strategic national stockpile right. and perhaps another 2,000 at the Defense Department. But since the estimates are that some 900,000 may be needed at the time of peak demand by COVID-19 patients and able to bring for themselves, the outlook for hospitals and individual healthcare providers appear challenging, which is why they've changed the uh, the directive and are now allowing the use of BiPAPs and CPAP machines, from what I understand. The new guidance said that examples of alternative use of respiratory devices used to address shortages might include CPAP, auto CPAP, and bi-level positive airway pressures, machine typically used for the treatment of sleep apnea. That's, this is like a guidance issued three days ago, which I was unaware of until this morning. So just to be clear, ventilators do not pull at all. They don't, they don't go to negative pressure. They just decrease positive pressure like a BiPAP machine, correct? Is, is, that, is that correct, Dr. Pai? That's a fairly correct statement. <clears throat> there are ventilators that can be set to negative end expiratory pressure. Um, uh, we've been saying PEEP, 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 PEEP means positive end expiratory pressure. That means the final resting pressure when you're done exhaling all the way. That's the resting pressure that would hold your alveoli open. Um, yeah. These single limb machines cannot function without some amount of positive end expiratory pressure. 
because they must be pushing oxygen forward all the time to wash out the, the carbon dioxide from your mask. If right. they didn't blow, then the carbon dioxide would be sitting there and you would re-inhale it. So PEEP is a requirement for those systems. It can be fairly low PEEP if your leak is really large and the air just blows out. Uh, but typically, most of these machines won't go below one or two uh, centimeters of water of PEEP. And older non-invasive ventilators that we, of which there are quite a few in the, still in the pipeline, obsolete, they wouldn't go below maybe four centimeters of PEEP because the way the, the uh, ventilator leak part of the circuit was constructed, they needed that amount of flow in order to blow it out. Yeah. The um, more so, modern ventilators that are closed circuit machines can have a negative phase to the respiration. They can have negative end expiratory pressure. And that's principally used for people who have hyperinflation syndromes, uh, severe end stage COPD, where all their alveoli are sort of chewed up. And they have these large, instead of small sacs in their lungs, they have large ones and they get air trapping. And so you may actually like to help them breathe out a little bit. So those are very rarely used, and I think many ventilators don't have it. You know, what, what I hear, what I want to reiterate is something that Adam and I have looked at. It's a, it's a, it's a, a world health site that would seemingly indicate that if you become severe, well, it, what it does is it, it says worldwide, the percentage of patients that, get, that, that have recovered it's about 14, 13% that have died, actually, that they can say have gotten sick and then recovered. So it's clear that it's a very progressive disease. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So this is obviously pretty dang serious in terms of the number that have potentially died. But that other that, that indication is that that data is probably being driven by Italy and Spain in places where it's gotten out of control. And by gotten out of control, it just means that people aren't getting the proper medical attention. Adam, there should be a, uh, 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 a, uh, a uh, statewide emergency call for anybody with old, old respirators, old, old CPAP machines. They can be used, especially if they have more of the mass for the ventilators, they can clearly be used as a substitute. So as they are, certainly a BiPAP machine and even some of the, you know, maybe they can, they can help control the valves or something or create valves, but I think there should be a recall, uh, 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 an outpouring of, of um, support for people coming up with the old machines and anything they can. Dr. Craig, I'd, I'd love to ask you one final call to action. Do you, you want to leave our audience with and our community with? This has been amazing. I can't thank you and Dr. Stein enough. Um, you know, we're going to be doing a lot more of this at sleepapnea.org. Uh, we invite people to come to our sites no matter which way they, they enter, whether it's on the web or via the Facebook channels or our forums or Instagram or Twitter or in the professional LinkedIn groups. Um, we definitely want to get the best, most accurate, up-to-date information, and I think this has been a great start uh, to helping educate, and I think we all got a lot smarter. Uh, and it's, once again, I'm the dumbest person in the room, but I enjoy and I love every second of it, and I want to give you the last word and the, the call to action. Uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Adam. I, I really would like to echo what Dr. Stein said. There is a secret hidden reserve of ventilatory capacity in the country at this time, and that is all of the machines that have gone into the hands of CPAP users that are not currently being used. They may be backup machines, they may be extra or travel machines, they may be uh, obsolete or duplicate machines. They may be machines that have some small problem with them that could be readily fixed, uh, you know, accessories missing or something of that kind. I do think there would be value in attempting to uh, collect all of that material and create it as a supplementary stockpile for those hospitals that potentially may need it. Um, I think it's absolutely correct what we heard about the, the need for ventilators. Uh, remember, if the best estimates we have are that a minimum of perhaps 250,000 Americans will die from this disease with quality treatment. That's looking sort of at the best outcomes that have been achieved in the areas that were not overstressed. And the worst, if we get good medical care, roughly one and a half million, maybe 1.7 million people. Um, with poor medical care, 
poor, by poor medical care, I really mean no medical care for those who need a ventilator and can't get one. With the absence of ventilatory support, the death rate will at least double. Everything we see shows that. That is the, the message that comes out of Italy and Spain and other places where we see patients lying on the floors. Only social isolation can prevent us from having that experience in every city in the United States. It is social isolation that allows us to keep those peaks somewhere near the number of ventilators that we really have. And in fact, because the United States is quite large and geographically diverse, it's totally possible that we could take a place like New York, get it completely under control, and be able to move doctors and material, ventilators and other material, out of New York and off to San Francisco or, or you know, Los Angeles or wherever the next big peak is, because New York would have successfully brought their volumes down. Now, that doesn't mean people won't get it. It may circulate two or three years, but you certainly, if you're going to get it, you certainly want to get it at a time when there's a bed for you and a ventilator for you and your doctor's not in quarantine. So I think we, we should call on everybody to honor the quarantines, to honor the social separation, to honor the lockdowns. That is the thing that can make a huge, massive difference, cut death rates in half. And then let's see if we can't collect some of these old, unused uh, CPAP machines and allow them to be repurposed where they are going to be desperately needed. That's an amazing uh, call to action. And I think that's a challenge for everyone in our community and for all our overlapping communities. You know, I like to always say that everyone sleeps. There's 8 billion of us in this world. The one thing we all have in common, chronic to rare, cradle to grave. And, you know, the only one extra caveat is, is I like the idea of the call to action for supplies and obsoletes and what's sitting in the garage or in the closet. Is there a possibility that we could get people with 3D printers and, and jamming these parts out for people? Um, we've seen stuff like that. I mean, these are, these are vacuum blowers, right, at the end of the day? There are a number of efforts underway to uh, make homebrew ventilators, to make uh, parts for ventilators where the parts are, you know, they're obsolete and the parts have gone missing and nobody has them. Uh, I think that effort is pretty seriously underway. If upon collecting a lot of almost working devices or working devices, if upon doing so, we could identify certain parts that need to be printed, there's a massive community that's prepared to print them and can do so very quickly. So I think that's a great addition to this kind of a thought. Yeah, I think these are the kind of parallel efforts we're going to need to do, whether we get this under control. And, you know, if, if obviously, you know, if New York is under control or not, if the next one's Florida, Louisiana, Texas, if it's going east to west, I mean, maybe California is going to look amazing because they were so early to the quarantine. And you, you got to give props to get Governor uh, Newsom for that. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's the people who hesitate and the paralysis is what's not going to get us anywhere right now. Um, Jills, I didn't give you sort of a, a chance to jump in with your sort of last call to action, but if would love to give it and open up to you, uh, considering your experience with the cancer community and compromised immune systems over all these years, I'm, I'm sure those people would love to hear from you. Now, the only thing I have to say is that it's really, we all have to work really hard to help people find the right information. There is so much disinformation that like multiply the uh, the feeling of unease that people have. They hear it, they hear information black, and then five minutes later, they hear the opposite. And I think that what we're doing right now is just one little example. I hope we're going to have many more of those webcasts where we can help people find the right information coming straight from real experts. Thank you, Dr. Fayette, for doing this. Thank you for being here. I just want to chime in. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot, and it's also um, making me think of what the um, what the small business innovators might do. Um, I'm not sure you can't make a CPAP machine out of a vacuum cleaner and a hose and a bag, as you start to describe it to me. And you know, there are some things that we might want to start thinking about getting out there to the media and to the, to, to, to the, to the governments and the media about this. Um, so, Peter, I'd, I'd say uh, let's, let's leave uh, that as our cliffhanger. I invite everyone to visit us at sleepapnea.org. Uh, register with us. Stay tuned for more newsletters, blogs, podcasts, uh, and Facebook Lives and webcasts. 
Uh, we will have our summit May 15th. Uh, it'll be, our, uh, once again, our national annual summit. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of this conversation will dictate the, the agenda for that. And may we all be here in May uh, that hopefully we've uh, stopped this peak and uh, flattened this curve to buy us some time. Because right now, time is, is, is the asset that we need uh, for all of us to make it through this. Because where we go one, we go all. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Thank you, Jills. Thank you, Dr. Peter, my cousin. <laughs> good night, good luck, and may the force be with all of us. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.